Now, this week we have uh, evidence relating to the Haemophilia Society for the first three days, hearing days. Um, a number of uh, people will be in the uh, hearing room. Can I just remind people, it's been some time since uh, we started last, before we started last week, before, since we had a, a number of people uh, in the, the hearing room for obvious reasons. But uh, there was an occasion last week when somebody took a photograph, uh, which later on appeared in the media, which appeared to be within the, the hearing room. Can I just remind people to be very, very careful. No photography should take place within the hearing room. Uh, and outside, be careful only to take photographs which may include uh, individuals who've been at the inquiry with their permission. Uh, this is something which um, we regard as being important, uh, and everyone has complied uh, thoroughly so far with the odd, the odd lapse. Um, but um, I just thought I ought to remind people, as I've been asked to do, uh, of what is our, our general, general rule and principle. Uh, I'm sorry to have uh, interfered with uh, the start of your evidence, Ms. Weatherall, but um, uh, you're due to give evidence before us. Uh, the people that you see in front of you uh, are, are only a small uh, proportion of the numbers that you are really speaking to. Last week, we had a, an audience ranging between about 200 to over 700 uh, on the various days of the, the hearings. Uh, and it may very well be something similar uh, this week. So you're talking to a, a large audience, uh, but immediately to those who, who are in front of you uh, and uh, your, your lawyer and others to your left. Now, Mary, would you uh, ask Mr. Weatherall, please, to take the oath? You can take your mask down when you're speaking. Please state your full name. Uh, Peter Claude Weatherall. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely... I do solemnly, sincerely... And truly declare and affirm... And truly declare and affirm... That the evidence I shall give... That the evidence I shall give... Shall be the truth... Shall be the truth... The whole truth... The whole truth... And nothing but the truth... And nothing but the truth. Uh, Mr Weatherall, if you feel it more comfortable to do so, please feel free to remove your, your mask. Thank you. Well, whilst you're giving evidence, anyway. Mr. Mr. Weatherall, um, I can see that in front of you, you've got a file next to you and some notes, just to confirm that the file is the, the documents that were sent to you by the inquiry in case the electronic copy is difficult for you to see on the screen. It is. And the notes are just a, as a, a, memory, a memory aid. Yes. Can I start by just sketching out with you some dates of your involvement with the Haemophilia Society? so that we all have the chronology in our minds. You became an ordinary member of the Haemophilia Society in late 1978. Correct. That, and that was following the diagnosis of your son with Haemophilia B. Correct. And then in 1981, you became the chairman of your local branch. Possibly a little earlier. But certainly in 1981, I was the chairman of the local branch of the Cambridge Haemophilia Society. And you might have become the chairman slightly before that, but we know that in 81, you certainly were the chairman. Absolutely, chair by then. yes, I was the chairman in 81. And you remained as chairman of the branch until 1983 when you joined the executive committee of the society. Yes, I believe that's correct. And it's right, isn't it? You were elected at the 1983 AGM, which was in the April. I was elected on the 23rd of April, 1983. And the first committee meeting you attended was on the 12th of May, 1983. That would have been the first full formal committee meeting I attended. I believe there was a, an informal gathering shortly after the AGM, but only to say hello and introduce ourselves and but yeah the first formal meeting I attended was on the 12th of May 1983. 
and your time on the executive committee ended in April 1985? Uh, no, it ended in June 1985. Because the annual general meeting of 1985 took place a little later that year, and it was at St Thomas's Hospital in June 1985. Your involvement in the society was as a volunteer, wasn't it? You weren't a paid member of staff. Yes, I was a volunteer. And you were doing this role with the Haemophilia Society alongside your full-time job... Uh, working at the Department of Health and Social Security. Is that right? Correct, but I would say by then it was the Department of Social Security. The health bit had become detached. Can you tell us just briefly what your role in your full-time job was? Right, OK. Um, I was employed in the executive uh, grade. Um, my duties were consistent with that grade. Uh, over a number of years. Uh, I was also a lay officer uh, for the Society of Civil and Public Servants that became the National Union of Civil and Public Servants. And uh, in that role, I had various negotiating uh, tasks uh, in relation to our membership uh, with the appropriate levels of management in the London North region at that time. Was there ever any overlap between what you were doing in your full-time role, your, your paid work, and what you were doing with the society? No. I'd like to go back to when you were the chairman of the Cambridge branch. Yeah. In 1981, and in, you've described for us in your statement that part of your role was to provide fellowship, advice and support to families with newly diagnosed children subject to consent being obtained by the centre director. Correct. Can you help us by what you mean by subject to the consent of the centre director? The consent would have to be obtained from the centre director's patients in order for the local branch of the Haemophilia Society, the members of that branch, to approach those individuals. So it was consent to have contact with the families rather than consent about what you said to those families? Correct. Can you describe for us how the local branch interacted with the local centre director? Yeah, at the relevant time... Uh, the centre director was... Can I mention his name? Is that appropriate? Yes, absolutely. I think it has been redacted in documents, but is it correct for me to mention his name? I, I, I understand so. Yeah, yes. is that all right? Dr Chalmers was the centre director at the Addenbrooke's Hospital Haemophilia Centre uh, at the relevant time. Um, the local branch had a fundraising... Um, capacity and we in conjunction with Centre Director Dr Chalmers in consultation with him uh, we would try and raise funds to improve facilities at the centre the actual facilities at the Cambridge Centre were I think it true to say the corridor of the laboratory not a very comfortable environment, or indeed a very welcoming environment, um, but nonetheless, you know, given the financial stringencies of the time, you know, that was the situation in the NHS. And what we would try and do is raise money to improve facilities, make life more comfortable for people in the corridor. Um, we had no clinical relationship with him as a group. Only individual patients had that relationship. And when you gave advice to families, what sources of information did you rely on to give that advice? Uh, the text we usually referred to and recommended was a book um, by Dr Peter Jones, uh, Living with Haemophilia. And of course we had our own experiences of dealing day to day with haemophiliac children. Um, 
our relationship with the centre director is really based upon that two-strand approach. One, raising money to improve the facilities. Two, being available to those parents of newly diagnosed children, boys, so that we could provide some measure of support. Won't use the word reassurance, because that's a very difficult thing to try and to deal with for people who are dealing with the shock of having their lives completely changed by, by this by this event. But providing them with some information that may help them and to offer them the services of the group such as it was at that time. Encourage membership and involvement in our small group. In terms of uh, actual advice in relation to how they should you know, manage their lives, that wasn't really something that we were qualified to do, certainly not in any clinical sense. But we all found, living with haemophilia, this invaluable book by Dr Peter Jones uh, to be an important text that we could recommend to people. Did you steer them as well towards the publications from the society, the bulletins and things like that? Um, no. They would only receive those bulletins and those publications if uh, they became members of the society, so that they would be posted to them, or they would come across them at the Haemophilia Centre at Addenbrooke's Hospital because there was a leaflet rack with the publications displayed there with the consent and agreement of the um, centre director. And when the group met together, did they discuss things they'd read in the bulletin together if there was an article that had prompted issues? Was that something that happened in the local group? Well, as I recall it, the agenda for the local group meetings were pretty much mainly concerned with the activities of the group in relation to fundraising uh, and the sort of events that we could encourage other people to join in with. Um, we didn't discuss, in any formal agenda sense, um, our respective difficulties with the medical conditions that were common to all of us. But I mean, naturally, whilst having refreshments after the meeting, you know, people would, would mention certain things about what had happened to them and their children. Yeah, but it was never a formal agenda item. And in those informal discussions over coffee at the end of the meetings, was there any discussion generally about bulletins and about information that had been received from the society? I don't recall that. Do you have any impression of how much weight your local group members placed on the information they were receiving in things like the bulletin? Very difficult to say. Could we have document DHSC 000 Double two zero five underscore double zero four, please. Uh, this is a letter that you wrote to your local MP in your capacity as chair of the branch. We can see it's dated the seventh of February, nineteen eighty one. Yes. And it says, members of the Cambridge branch of the Haemophilia Society are distressed by a recent World in Action television programme, December the 22nd, and reports in the national press which have focused attention on the plight of the blood products laboratory at Elstree, and then slightly further down. Furthermore, it would appear, appear that production of factor eight is limited to the extent that 2.5 to 3 million pounds per year has to be expended on imported factor derived from the United States and third world countries. In the former case, the factor runs a high risk of infecting our members with hepatitis because of the skid row sources from which blood is purchased. 
And at the end of the letter, uh, you ask for your MP to take the matter up with Dr Gerard Vaughan. Yes. Can you tell us how this letter came to be written by you? Um, yes, I, I, it was drafted at a meeting of the Cambridge branch of the Haemophilia Society round about the beginning of February. Um, I, it's, it, it's my wording. I, I recognise the uh, slightly um, awkward style of the, uh, the grammar there, places. Um, it was drafted in a bit of a hurry because it was brought up at the meeting. It wasn't an actual agenda item, as I recall it, but members came to that meeting very distressed about that program. Although it was on the 22nd of December, uh, the end of the last previous year, the concerns revealed in that program about the state of play at BPL is still very much uppermost in their minds. And you know, I think it was decided by all of us present that we ought to write to our local MPs. Now it's not now the letter was actually sent to all of the local MPs as I recall it. And Ian Stewart, as I subsequently recalled, was actually the MP for Hitchin in North Hearts, and we had members in that part of the world. Um, it's worth noting at this stage that the Cambridge branch of the Haemophilia Society uh, took in really all those people who had involvement with the Addenbrooke's um, Haemophilia Centre. And that extended you know, to North Hertfordshire, um, West Suffolk, Huntingdonshire, as well as, you know, the Cambridgeshire, actual Cambridgeshire hinterland. Um, and it was decided, in, in the light of the concerns that had been bubbling away in members' minds, um, and notes had been taken by people who actually saw that programme, and it was decided to send letters out to our respective MPs. And the one you have in front of you is obviously one that Ian Stewart sent to the Department of Health. Do you think you might have provided a, a copy of any of these letters to the National Office of the Haemophilia Society? Well, Mrs Leslie Duncan, the secretary, was very conscientious, and I'm sure she would have done so. And did you get any response from the society? I don't recall getting a response from anybody, to be honest. You've preempted my next question yeah, of whether you'd got any that. response, not at all, no. whether you got any response from any of the MPs that you'd written to trying to think back well you might have had a postcard saying your comments have been noted but nothing but, substantive but nothing, that you nothing recall. substantial nothing substantial that I can recall and we're going back you know to 1981 you then joined the executive committee as we said in 1983 yes can you tell us what your primary interest in doing that was well, I had a really interest in organisation, um, because I had a trade union background. Um, I, I wanted to see if the Haemophilia Society could sort of fit into that kind of model in some way. But So I was interested in, 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 in the organisational side of things. Um, I, I was obviously, I suppose the word is, privileged and flattered you know, to have been invited to join. Um, Dr. Cookner took me to one side and asked me if I was willing to serve on the executive committee. And, you know, I felt, well, yes, you know, I do, do have some knowledge of working to agendas and attending meetings and so on, so I might have some, some skills I can bring to bear. Um, so I was elected on the 23rd of April 1983. And when you talk about being interested in organisation and the organisational side of things, when you're talking about that, are you meaning how the groups interacted with the national body? Is that what you're thinking of? Yes. Can you tell us how that did in fact operate during your time? How did the executive committee and the groups interact? Primarily through the um, council meeting. 
that took place two or three times a year during the time I was on the executive committee. The groups were invited to send I mean, delegates isn't really the right word. Um, I've, got to, I've got to try and avoid you know, using trade union language here because it wasn't a trade union uh, in that sense at all. Interested people from local groups came to the council meetings and that was the main link with the executive committee. In fact, the executive committee was elected by the people who came from the local groups at the AGM. Um, Dr. Kuttner had been the group liaison officer and I think he had connections you know, with, with the groups. But I think the main source of connection on a day-to-day -day basis between the groups and those individuals who were active within the groups uh, was with the office in Trinity Street, uh, where the coordinator um, responded to communications, telephone calls, letters, and so on. Um, so the, the group structure seemed to me at the time to be rather kind of loose. Um, some groups were much better kind of organised and situated than others. The group that springs to bind principally is the Newcastle group, which was attached to Dr Peter Jones. And they were extremely well organised, very, very good fundraisers, um, very able people. And there were smaller groups that I believe at the time were struggling with. So it was a, an uneven situation uh, across the country. Oh yes, and the Scottish group were also very, very well organised. Um, but yeah, that was the situation. How easy was it for, partic for groups to raise particular issues with the executive committee? Well, there are two ways of doing it in the formal sense. They could table motions for discussion at executive committee meetings. They could table motions to be debated at the general at the council meetings. Of course, at the annual general meeting, providing advance notice was given to the chair in the usual way. Um, and of course, on a day-to-day -day basis, as I said earlier on, um, they would communicate with Trinity Street. So, if the executive committee was determining a particular policy matter. How were the groups made aware of that? Or was it something that they were told about later? Was there advance, advance warning or was it just afterwards? I think it tended to be that decisions were made by the executive committee and then pretty much promulgated to the group. Um, as I say, I'm sort of qualifying that by saying that there was always the opportunity for groups to table motions, and in my time uh, that did happen. Um, there was the opportunity for motions to be tabled at council meetings, but council meetings, I think, as I said earlier on, happened at uh, intervals throughout the year, but not as regularly as the executive committee meetings. So I think really you had the situation where the executive committee was, in a sense, charged with the responsibility of making executive decisions, which were felt to be in accordance with the wishes of the membership at any one time. And on the executive committee, how did you ascertain what those wishes were? The main conduit was certainly through um, Trinity Street office, through the coordinator, David Waters. He was in regular contact with the groups. Um, receiving representations from the groups and from individual members.
papers were prepared for consideration by the executive committee, I'm thinking back to the blood products subcommittee. And the one I remember actually that was put together by Ken Milne was, was rather sort of technical. Um, but all these, these, um, all these decisions, all these documents are of course reported in the annual report and your annual report was submitted to the annual general meeting for endorsement by the assembled groups. So would it be fair to say that the predominant decision-making was by the executive committee, but members could raise concerns at particular times in the year or through phone calls to the coordinator if they had concerns? Yeah. And did you have any sense of whether particular groups had greater access or, or found it easier to raise issues than other groups. You mentioned no. that Newcastle was very well organised, um, but was there a, a sense of certain groups having more access? I don't believe so. And you were on the executive committee for the two years that we've, just over two years that we've talked about. During those years, did any of those issues of um, interaction between the groups and the executive committee change or, or was it very much like that throughout your time? Pretty much the same throughout my time. I want to go back to the AGM in April 1983 when you were elected yes. to the committee and you recall a talk by Professor Bloom at that meeting. Now oh. in in, in paragraphs 21 and 28 of your witness statement, you say that you became aware of AIDS from the Killer in the Village programme on the 25th of April and from Press and Media in May 1983. I understand you want to put on record a correction to your witness statement about when you first came to know about AIDS. So can you tell us when you think you first became aware of it? Well, I attended the annual general meeting of the 23rd of April 1983, the meeting at which I was elected. And like all those present, I listened to the address from Professor Bloom. The address was to do with home therapy, a very important topic at the time. But he did touch upon, quite incidentally, I can't remember why, but he did touch upon uh, the issue of AIDS in relation to the emergence of AIDS in the United States, which I think, as I said earlier on, um, we were kind of aware of from reports about the situation in San Francisco earlier in the year in you know, certain newspapers. But um, my memory was prompted by receiving a document quite recently, which does actually demonstrate quite clearly that he did touch upon the topic of AIDS. And he also mentioned uh, in the same meeting, and he wasn't questioned about this, this is something that came up absolutely apropos of nothing, as I recall now, um, the issue of um, someone he reported who was rumoured uh, to be a haemophiliac with um, with mild symptoms, I think. Now that my memory was prompted by a document that I received quite recently, which is why it's not in my original witness statement. Now a point about the twenty fifth of April, which was the Monday following the Saturday on which the annual general meeting took place is that on that, that evening, Horizon broadcast the Killer in the Village programme. I didn't see that programme, and at the time I was working away in London, we lived in Cambridge, and I often didn't get back until quite late in the evening because of work commitments and so on. But my wife did see it, and she told me about it, and it kind of fitted with what was 
be mentioned at the, the AGM on Saturday. So I think my, my, my first kind of true awareness of AIDS as a transmissible disease was at that weekend and that Monday or the Monday evening when my wife told me about Killer in the Village. So I think that's got to be it. Just so there's no mystery about the document that you received, it was the 1983 bulletin dealing with a, re a record of the AGM, wasn't Correct. it? Correct. You said a moment ago that after you were elected to the executive committee, there was an informal gathering of those who'd been elected. Yes. What, when was that? Uh, it was immediately after the meeting. So the same day as the meeting, yeah, straight yeah. afterwards? It was just a quick gathering, to say hello, you know. And if I could now have DHSC triple zero one double two eight, please, Shumik. This is a letter that went out to members, as we can see, on the 4th of May, 1983. Yeah. Before the letter went out to members, were you told anything about it as an executive committee member? I was told nothing about it in advance of its issue. And as a member of the society, did you receive a copy? I believe so, yeah. So when it landed on your doorstep, was that a surprise to you? Yes. Your first committee meeting was then on the 12th of May, 1983. Yes. And if we can look at those minutes, uh, Shumik, it's HSOC 0029476 underscore 024. And if we go just below the uh, headline of agenda, we can see that you were given a special welcome as a new member. Yes. And if we turn to page two, there's the heading AGM report back. That's right. Now, before we go to that, this was obviously your first meeting of the executive committee. Yeah. What was your impression of how the committee felt about the 4th of May letter having gone out to members? I, I think the, the committee um, were absolutely entirely comfortable with that letter going out. Did anyone express surprise that it had gone out without all the committee being involved in it? Or, or was your sense that people had been told? I can't remember now, to be honest. I'm not going to try and, you know, speculate. Mm. But the, le the let the hit, it had gone out and the circumstances under which it had been issued were explained with the evidence, the press cuttings... I think it was my first meeting and I, I was pretty much seized of the need for the society, I think, to do something pretty urgently to deal with the reaction from members to the report in the mail on Sunday. Uh, the coordinator of David Waters, you know, reported upon the calls to the office and the general general distress, I think, of the of the members at the time. 
I think it was also reported that the Mail on Sunday had not consulted the Haemophilia Society about that article. There had been no prior notice that it was going to go out. No comment had been sought in advance. And that um, something had to be done urgently to try and allay the fears of the members. Um, I think there had been a discussion between Arthur, Professor Arthur Bloom and the Reverend Alan Tanner about the approach that should be taken and that's, that's the approach that they had agreed. The decision had been taken to issue it and of course that's when pretty much the policy was determined. If we can look at that, yeah. um, we, we've got it on the screen. It's halfway through the paragraph with the heading AIDS. The chairman outlined his action in mailing his letter of the 4th of May 1983 to the mm. entire membership of the society. Mm. And it was agreed unanimously that until there's evidence to prove otherwise, the society's policy would be to encourage members to continue with their present treatment programmes, subject to the advice of their centre directors. Correct and that full support would be given to self-sufficiency and blood products at the earliest possible Correct. date. Can you remember in that uh, discussion, when, when it was agreed unanimously, what information did the committee have about from, from clinicians? What, what was conveyed to the committee about what Professor Bloom or, or others had said? I really don't recall the, act, the detail of the discussion, I'm sorry to say. Do you recall anyone questioning um, the uh, advice or, or the views uh, in light of the media coverage or in light of the Killer in the Village programme that you've referred to? No. Uh, and do you recall if anything was discussed at the meeting about why advice had only been sought in May 1983 uh, rather than at an earlier stage? No. Sorry, do, do you, you don't recall... Or, or it wasn't discussed? That was a, a question I should have clarified. Yeah, um, I don't recall uh, that there was any discussion about the need to obtain information about AIDS transmission sooner than it coming up at the AGM on the 23rd of April. Now... I said it wasn't prompted by any question from the floor at the AGM, but I don't know if it was prompted elsewhere. I don't know, is the honest answer. Thank you. And if we look at the bottom of this page, we can see that the there was a meeting uh, that was going to be arranged with the minister, yeah. uh, but had let, had that meeting had been abandoned because of the general election. Uh, but in any event, there were three um, items that had been agreed on for that meeting with the minister. Uh, firstly, an assurance of self-sufficiency within two years. And then secondly, over the page at the top, there'll be no attempt to suspend the importation of US commercial products without definite evidence that this would be necessary and thirdly, that the government would give adequate support to research into AIDS in the UK. Just focusing in on that second bullet point about uh, no attempt to suspend the importation of US products, what was the discussion within the executive committee about that? The importance of maintaining the supply of blood products What, what particularly were, were the executive committee members uh, addressing? The imperative question of maintaining the supply of blood products to haemophiliacs. Was there any discussion within the committee of any medical advice that had been received? I don't recall that. Was there any discussion about the possibility of a, a temporary uh, suspension of importation I don't recall that uh, 
We know that this meeting was on the 12th of May. Could we now turn to BPLL 000-1351 underscore 076, please? This is a letter that was written by uh, David Waters on the 9th of May to the members of the Medical Advisory Panel, yes. uh, setting out uh, the points that were intended to be raised with the meeting with Geoffrey Finsberg, and asking at the end uh, to, uh, that David Waters obtain any view you may hold on those matters and also any other subjects which you feel we should raise at this time. When the committee met on the 12th of May, did you have any views from the medical advisory panel available to you when you were making the decisions? Um, we were following, I think, the uh, advice of Professor Arthur Bloom. Um, there was a letter from Professor Bloom um, in which he touched upon the need for the MRC to be alerted to the need for funding into AIDS-related research projects. And there was a letter to David Waters on the 12th of May. Shall, shall we turn that up so that everyone else can see it yeah, as well? Yeah, I think that's important. It's BPLL 000-1351 underscore 075. Is that the letter you're meaning? Yes, it is. So we can see in that letter um, that he has uh, received the, the points from David Waters and he's also at the end of the paragraph, first paragraph, as you've said, uh, Professor Bloom says you could ask Mr Finsberg if he could draw the attention of the MRC to AIDS and to the desirability for funding for AIDS-related research projects. Do you recall if this letter was available to the executive committee when you were discussing your decision of what would be put to the minister? Uh, no. This letter is dated the 12th of May. The executive committee meeting took place on the 12th of May. So as far as you can recall, when the executive committee were making those decisions on the 12th of May, they didn't at that time have anything, as far as you can recall, from the medical advisory panel. Well, we had the communication from Professor Arthur Bloom that was in incorporated in the Reverend Alan Tanner's letter of the 4th of May. That had gone out to all the members, yes. Absolutely. The next meeting of the Executive Committee that you attended was on the 14th of June. It's HSOC 0029476 underscore 025. HSOC 0029476 underscore 025. Thank you. And if we go over to the second page, please. We can see at the top of the second page the heading AIDS and we can see that the chairman briefly summarised the situation uh, and it was agreed that further discussion should be deferred until the July meeting since the matter was due to be discussed at the forthcoming Congress in Stockholm. It was reported that the confirmed uh, Cardiff case was now back at work and in reasonably good health. Was the executive committee told where the information about the Cardiff case uh, had, be, had come from? Was it made explicit who had provided that information to the society? No. And was it your assumption that it had come from Professor Bloom, given that it was Cardiff? Yes, I'm afraid it was. I did make an assumption there. Not an unreasonable one in the circumstances. Not at all. Um, there's... 
a reference to the discussion being deferred uh, and, and, and it, the minutes could be read as that really there wasn't much discussion at that point. It was a, a rubber stamping of a decision to park the issue. Would that be fair? Yes, I think it would be fair to say that there had been no negative developments at that point. Um, and, I mean, the Congress in Stockholm was looming. I think it took place at the end of June. Yeah, it did, yeah. And it was clearly going to be a, an issue at that conference. And indeed it was. So I think, yeah, I think it's, to use your words, it was parked temporarily. And was your sense of the committee that they were comfortable with that decision to park it, or, or was there some discussion and debate about whether it should be addressed more substantially at that point in time? No, because we, we as, as I recall it, I, I think the, the sort of feeling of panic among the membership had abated somewhat. I don't think David was receiving quite the same volume of calls to the Trinity Street office at that time. Um, but that's as much as I can recall. The minute, I think, does accurately reflect the situation at that time. Shumit, could we turn to the July minutes, HSOC, 029476 underscore 026, please. These are the minutes from the 14th of July. Um, and if we go to just under the agenda, we can see, unfortunately we can't see, but uh, because our redactions team have been... Um, too good. Uh, you, in fact, had sent your apologies uh, to this meeting. Yeah, I can't remember the exact circumstances as to why I couldn't get there, but it may have had to do with getting my son treated urgently. He had a lot of bleeds. I don't know. I can't remember. The reason I wanted to, to pick up this meeting at Mr Weatherall, was, was simply to ask what happened in those circumstances. If you sent your apologies to an executive uh, committee meeting, were you sent the agenda in advance for, for meetings? Gosh. I can't remember. Um, I received... So so many agendas because I was involved with so many meetings in my day job um, I, I, I mean good manners would suggest that an agenda was sent out in advance yeah but I can't remember and if you sent your apologies obviously if it was a last minute difficulty this might not be possible but mm. generally if you needed to send your apologies to a meeting were you able to give your views ahead of the meeting to someone? Could you input into the issues no, ahead? No, I wouldn't do that. Uh, um, did you receive minutes afterwards? Yes. So was there an opportunity then to raise anything yes. that you wanted? Well, clearly, I mean, the minutes would only be ratified at a subsequent meeting. And one would have the opportunity, if one had been at the meeting, to correct any mistakes in the minutes that one had identified. Um, and to raise matters arising. In this July Executive Committee meeting, if we go over the page, Shumit, please, we have the heading AIDS, and there's a note that this Southern group had presented a, a, a resolution for discussion. Oh, yes. We can see it there, yeah. that the society alerts the minister to the fact that the German government has banned American imports of blood products and the UK should do the same. The Southern Group is most concerned that we're still using factor eight imported from America. There's then some comments made 
and we then see that the executive committee were unanimous in their view that the position in the UK remains as it did on the 4th of May when the chairman wrote to all society members along with a statement from Professor Bloom and it was agreed that the coordinator should write to Professor Bloom giving him an opportunity to write again amending any statements in That's that right. letter. Now I'm very aware you weren't at the executive committee m meeting, but were you made aware of any of the discussion that took place at that meeting uh, about this resolution? No. So after the executive committee meeting, there wasn't an... an immediately after, before the next meeting, there wasn't a discussion between you and any other executive committee meeting? About I don't recall it. I don't recall any discussion about that issue. Could we then turn to the minutes of the August meeting, HSOC 0029476 underscore 027, please. And if again we turn to the second page... We have the heading Southern Group Resolution at re aids And we can see there that it's recorded that the coordinator reported Southern Group had circulated their resolution to all groups. The coordinator wished to place on record his gratitude to Messrs Marshall, Bishop and Barber of Alpha, Armour and Cutter respectively, who had all made international checks on the content of the resolution which further substantiated the fact that Germany had not banned the import of US blood products. Uh, if we just pause there, what were the executive committee told about the communications with Alpha, Armour and Cutter? Well, it's re recorded in the minutes there that clearly an approach had been made um, by the society through the coordinator. It would have been the coordinator, I think, to have made that approach, unless, of course, Alan Tanner had decided to do it, or Ken Mill, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, was that seems to be the factual situation at the time. Was that information conveyed to the committee verbally? by the coordinator or was it was there anything in writing from those individuals at the pharmaceuticals no it was reported um, yeah orally at the meeting did any of the committee raise concerns about the fact that communication was, was with these three companies who it might be said had an interest in saying that there was that was the situation. In other words, did we seek any verification? Did we seek any... Was the question raised as to whether or not that advice had been monitored in any way? Is that what you mean? Y yes. Did anybody even raise the question of whether this was the best way to obtain the information? I don't recall that that question came up. And then the very last sentence of the paragraph we were just looking at, uh, it says a statement had been made to all groups clarifying the situation. What involvement had the executive committee had in writing that statement? Well, we didn't write it. And the statement would have, I'm sure, reflected, if I can reflect, re I mean, David was very meticulous uh, in his recording of minutes and preparation of statements. So it would have accorded the, the position that's described in the minute. Was the committee provided with a copy of the statement in advance? No, I don't recall seeing a copy of the statement in advance, no. It, it appears from these minutes that the statement had already gone out to the group. So had the committee even been made, made aware in advance that a statement was going out? Or was that something that was just dealt with by a smaller group? I think the statement would have been prepared 
in consultation with the Reverend Alan Tanner. But not with it anyone? Hadn't been, there had been no consultation with me that I can recall. Shumit, could we have HSOC 0020347, please? This is an agenda that was prepared for a meeting with Lord Glenarthur, um, and the document is dated the 8th of September 1983. I just want to look at one particular point in it with you, Mr Wetherill, if I may. If we look at point two, we can see it's got a subheading of no suspension of imported products. Yes. And then brackets, this is shakier than when first put on the agenda. And there's a, an explanation of what the society seeks. First of all, was this... Uh, agenda discussed again by the executive committee be before the September document here? I don't believe it was, but the agenda hadn't really changed in the, set, in the headings, because you recall that Finsburg, of course, um, left office in May, and I think Lord Glen Arthur sort of took over. What I remember, it was Glen Arthur, yes, who was to be met some months later, of course. I think the agenda was, was, was pretty much the same. Do you recall any discussion within the executive committee about this comment that the suspension of imported products is shakier than when first put on the agenda? No, no, I... I, I can't recall that term shakier. Um, no, I, I, I don't. That word shakier, it does not come to mind. If mm. we. The word shakier doesn't come to mind. Does any of the sense of it being a, a less strong point come to mind? No. Could we have HSOC double zero two nine four seven six underscore zero twenty eight, please? These are the executive. Committee uh, minutes of the 15th of September 1983. Yes. And if we turn the page to the second page, we can see a heading report of the meeting with Lord Glen Arthur. Thank you, Shimmick. We can see again the three points that were being addressed at, at the meeting. And, and again, I want to look at the second point in relation to the imported factor eight concentrates. And the minutes record that the society and the department agree that factor eight concentrates must continue to be imported from the USA. Any other course of action could only lead to people with haemophilia being exposed to even greater risks through lack of concentrates for bleeding episodes. This is still the view held by both parties in the knowledge of one recorded death at Bristol, which was suspected on the day of the meeting. When this was reported at the executive committee meeting was there any discussion about it well I'm sure there was a discussion in the light of the confirmed fatality Bristol but I cannot recall the detail of that discussion was there anyone on the committee voicing a different opinion to that which we find in the minutes? I don't believe so. It's not recorded in the minutes. And I'm sure David would have recorded 
any comments that were not in accordance with the decision that was taken to preserve the existing policy. Just picking up on that point about the minutes, Mr. Wetherill, the sense you've you've given so far, and I don't want to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, is that the minutes that David Waters took were generally very accurate and would have included things if they had been said. So if they're not in the minutes, is that David fair? was very skilled at taking minutes. Um, he always ensured that the key points were recorded and that discussions were summarised in quite a pithy way. He didn't write down he said, she said, they said. Um, and also, I've got to say this, the Reverend Tanner was a very, very skillful chairperson. He had the ability to summarise very quickly the sense of what the meeting intended or wished. And David faithfully recorded that position, I think. Um, uh, the, the Reverend Tanner had a very good sort of purchase on what was going on. He was rather more than just a chairman of a meeting. I think in some ways he had, he took on sort of executive powers. And David was um, sort of secondary to that sort of position, really. David was a very conscientious and loyal servant of the society. And I think worked conscientiously under the Reverend Tanner's chairmanship. Now, you've been uh, discussing what is on the screen, uh, uh, and I think the questioning and the answers have slipped into discussing what might have been said at the meeting. Hmm. What's on the screen appears on the face of it to be a report, not of what happened at the EC, and so not minuted in the way that you've described uh, Mr. Waters as minuting, but as what had happened in the meeting with Glen Arthur. Yes. So you're absolutely right. I, I took the witness to the wrong paragraph on the page. My sincere apologies. If we go to the end of the page, we see what the executive committee uh, discussed. That's my, my fault, sir. So it, it's the bottom page, it the is. bottom paragraph that we really ought to have been focusing on. M my apologies, sir. My highlighting was in the wrong place. That's uh, my error. Perhaps I can read, re read that for you and ask the, the questions uh, of you. The Executive Committee went on to consider AIDS in the UK more generally, and in particular the fact that the first AIDS-related death had now been confirmed in a 50-plus-year-old man in Bristol. Uh, the coordinator presented the view that this fact would eventually reach the press and that the, so the society should immediately issue a statement to all members advising them of the death and pointing out all the steps taken so far by the society in relation to AIDS. Uh, it was agreed that this would place people with haemophilia in a position of some strength when the subject hit the pages, uh, and there was an agreement to produce the leaflet with all possible speed, and that the executive committee would continue to keep a close watch on developments in the UK. Could we uh, look a little uh, further about that uh, element of the minutes? Um, what was the committee told about uh, the death of the man in Bristol? That there had been a death of a haemophiliac in Bristol. His name was not disclosed. The source of the um, information 
was not disclosed so far as I can recall. It was, mere, it was a report that, in fact, this had happened. And with that report, did that lead to any discussion within the executive committee about whether the uh, position that the society had taken in the meeting with Le Lord Glenarthur should be changed? Uh, no. No. because the advice that we were receiving from Professor Arthur Bloom at this time had not, not changed significantly, if at all. And that advice from Professor Bloom, how was that being conveyed to the Executive Committee? Well, it was reported that he had written, he'd been invited to comment on whether he, there was any adjustment to his previous advice or any qualification of his previous advice, and I believe that he had sort of maintained the position that uh, he'd adopted earlier in the year. So just in terms of the mechanics of that, it had come from Professor Bloom to uh, Reverend Tanner and Mr Waters, and then it came on to the Executive Committee. I believe so, yes. I mean, I really cannot recall the precise mechanics of this, or even if it was presented in that way but it was presented to the committee as a fact the circumstances of that individual were not disclosed his name was not disclosed, his family was not disclosed it was anonymised in that form and we can see at the end of the paragraph that there, uh, Mr Knight and the chairman uh, undertook to oversee the production of a, a leaflet. Mm. Yeah. Other than agreeing to the production of the leaflet, did the committee have any involvement in seeing it before it went to members or any involvement in what would be in it? Well, I can, I can only say I didn't see it. I didn't see a draft of it. That doesn't mean to say that other members didn't see it, but I didn't see it. We didn't have an editorial board, shall I put it that way? Um, so far as I can recall, Clive Knight was the editor, and Professor Tanner was a sort of joint editor, as well as being, sorry, the Reverend Tanner was the sort of joint editor. Um, no, I don't believe we had an editorial board. I don't see any reference to that in the minutes to remind me. And if we can turn to that leaflet, it's the Haemophac number two. Yes. PRSE three zeros double four seven four. And on the second page, please, Shuma. we can see on the right-hand side of the page, in bold, uh, that our message remains unchanged. The advantages of treatment far outweigh any possible risk. Yeah. Balance the risks for yourself, but we would state again that the risk of AIDS is tiny compared to the risks from untreated bleeding episodes. Was that the decision of the executive committee or was it simply the continuation of the previous decision? Had there been an active, no, a second I, active decision? I, I think it was a continuation of the existing policy. There had been no, as I recall, any reason to revise the policy at that stage. I mean... We didn't know the circumstances, as I say, of this individual in, in Bristol. We didn't know the circumstances of the individual in Cardiff. Um, other than that they were haemophiliacs. And of course there was also, I think, in the back of our minds, a feeling that may not have been the mere fact of being a haemophiliac. 
you see my point. I think it's probably more helpful if you could spell out what your what was in the back of your minds. Well, do you know the history of AIDS transmission? You do. Absolutely. It was occurring in the homosexual community. It was, I think, also occurring in the bisexual community, and inevitably it was going to be occurring in the heterosexual community. AIDS was in the community. So I think what you're saying, Mr Weatherall, is that in the back of your minds, uh, the committee perhaps thought that uh, being a haemophiliac was not the only risk factor for the individuals uh, who were being reported to you. If you go back to the AGM of the 23rd of April, when Professor Bloom reported on the fatalities in the United States, I think 13 of them, yeah, remember from reading the, the bulletin recently, have been members of the homosexual community. Could we move on then to the uh, October council meeting? Well, it's can, I, can I just come, before we, we leave that, the, the piece in italics, it, it, the, the editor uh, and uh, Reverend Tanner appear to think that there is a, a risk of AIDS, but it's tiny. That, that appears to be the, um, the import of the first sentence yeah. in italics. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and then uh, there's a, another sentence, and then it begins with this, with the, in capitals the word risk, has always been a feature of haemophilia. Yes. Um, in time this risk too will diminish. I'm not entirely sure how logically that follows uh, from a, a discussion of the risk of AIDS, because the risk, which had been a feature of haemophilia, was not a risk from AIDS at all previously, uh, as previously understood, was it? The risks were in relation to hepatitis and at the time, non-A, non-B hepatitis, that was understood. There may have been other risks that I wasn't aware of. But... <sighs> it's very difficult to describe this, um, unless you're bleeding, suffering, there's an immediate risk of harm, serious damage, if that bleeding episode is not addressed. So there's, there was always the risk that if you couldn't get a treatment, whether it was plasma, cryoprecipitate, blood profit products in this period, you would be at risk. Yes, but uh, I think the point I was, I was making is not that there was no risk, but it, it doesn't entirely strike me as, as logical that because you have some risk, you should have additional risk. Isn't, isn't that what this is actually saying? And, and it, uh, but perhaps I've got it wrong. Well, how do you quantify risk? It's not a question of quantification, is it? It's a question of addition. You can, have a, you if, can if surely have additional risks. Been suffered before. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. But it's, um, it's a matter of, of simply of comment, really. Well, look, I mean, I'm not in a position, honestly, to, to answer sort of philosophical points in relation to risk. No, it, it was a question of whether anyone picked that up at the time, and, and it follows, I think, from what you've been saying, that it's unlikely. I think, with respect, um, I, I don't think your sort of very fine reasoning would have been um, something that the Executive Committee would have 
not into. So very well. No, I I I follow that, and that, that's that's the evidence about what people were thinking at the time. That that's what I I want. Thank you. I note the time, so I wonder whether I'm about to move on to another topic. Yes, we'll, we'll take a, a, a break uh, now at, at that uh, that point. Um, we'll take a break for half an hour uh, until quarter to twelve. It'll give you a chance, uh, Mr. Weatherall, to, to draw breath and, yeah, and uh, perhaps have some coffee mm. um, uh, and others to do the same. Uh, what I have to, to say to you is what I say to all witnesses, that you're giving evidence. Yeah. What you must not do is discuss with anyone, whoever they are, yeah. the evidence you have given or might yet think that you might be asked to give. I understand that point, sir. Uh, you can talk about anything else you like. Thank you. Uh, quarter to twelve.